Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith, and I think you all know who this is, Shackleton the Explorer. So, in this video, I'm going to talk all about uh, the effect of aerosols on the atmosphere, but specifically in the context of a nuclear exchange between India and Pakistan. As we lived throughout the Cold War, we knew about the idea of detente, about mad, mutually assured destruction. Both sides, uh, the Soviet Union and the US, had enough nuclear weapons to completely obliterate the other side, so there was no war that was winnable. Hey, 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 hey. So, come on. Just stay right here, okay? If you want to eat those, there you go. No, 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 no. Okay. Okay, you stay here. Okay. Um, sorry about that. Okay, so the idea of uh, MAD or mutually assured destruction um, would, would make a war unwinnable. So that was uh, the reason why the Cold War was more a, a uh, war of detente with neither side making the first move towards a nuclear exchange. We came very close at some periods of time, like during the Cuban Missile Crisis, for example. So we've known also that, um, you know, detonating nuclear weapons puts a lot of soot and aerosols up into the atmosphere. And it turns out that the black carbon that would be put up into the atmosphere would, as it rises high up into the atmosphere, it's warmed by the sunlight. So that air around it is warmed, so that air around it continues to go upwards. So the problem is, is when that black soot is high up in the atmosphere, it continues to go higher. It stays there for a long period of time, blocks out a significant amount of the sun, and uh, you know threatens uh, the the uh, global food supply because it reduces sunlight hitting the earth. So a couple of recent things. Um, a while ago, there was a report on some of the wildfires in BC. The heat was so intense that there was large convective uplifting and um, they were, that allowed scientists to study you know, the effects of these aerosols in the atmosphere and they found that this could be you know, extremely serious. Um, and since then, uh, a more recent paper just in the last few days has come out talking about modeling basically a nuclear war between India and Pakistan. And it found that it wouldn't just be a regional Re there wouldn't just be regional effects. It's not just a regional conflict. It would extend to the globe and it would very possibly threaten global food supplies. So let me talk about the um, details of, of this work in these papers. So just a reminder, um, this is my website, paulbeckwith.net. Okay. Uh, so just uh, Google paulbeckwith.net to find it and please subscribe to my um, videos. You can subscribe to my YouTube channel and my posts. And please consider supporting my work with a donation at PayPal. Now, this is my Twitter page at Paul H. Beckwith. So I basically, uh, basically there's a tweet here, India-Pakistan nuclear war could kill millions and threaten global starvation. You know, over the span of a week, it could kill 50 to 125 million people. That's more than the death toll from all of Second World War. And then there'd be an additional huge number of people killed um, over time from a failing global food supply. So um, you can have a look at this, um, basically have a look at this tweet and I'll look at the details um, of what could happen. But first of all, you know, a quick look at nuclear weapon yields. So how much power is released? How much energy is released from nuclear detonations? Well, this is a plot of, this is the yield in kilotons, okay? And this is the weight of the weapon in kilograms. So we've got tactical low yield weapons. They're very, very light. Uh, you know, this is only 10 kilograms. This is 100 kilograms. So you know, less than 100 kilograms, half that, a quarter of that, um, you know, with, with, with uh, these are sort of tactical uh, weapons that would be used on a 
battlefield. These are the, um, the uh, early H-bombs over here. Uh, sorry, Little Boy and Fat Man, the first atomic bombs that were used to end World War II. Little Boy and Fat Man um, dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So this is the weight here. Um, this is a thousand. This is a thousand kilograms. So, you know, between you know, a couple thousand kilogram weight yields of about ten, about twelve to fifteen kilotons. The early H bombs were up here, and these are some of the most um, the, the 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 largest uh, weapons. These are airdrop airdropped or the red missile warheads are the the um, brown or brownish color or orange actually and there's a Taylor limit of maximum efficiency six kilotons of yield per kilogram of weapon so these are the type of idea of the the yields and uh, there's lots of information on this site about the lightest so these are the tactical weapons the Hiroshima weapons 13 to 18 kilotons and you go all the way up to Sarbamba 50,000 uh, kilotons, the most powerful nuclear weapon ever detonated, or 50 megatons, okay? And these are hydrogen bombs, so the fission um, combines in with fusion of the hydrogen to make the bomb much more intense. And if you look at all nuclear testing as of 1996, 510,300 kilotons, about 10% of that is just in the one device, the Sarbamba device alone. And this is the fireball radius for different weapons. So with a Sarbamba 2.3 kilometer fireball, Castle Bravo 15 megatons, I think that's the strongest US uh, one, 1.42 kilometers and so on. So there's lots of information on this site. Now in terms of the number of nuclear warheads worldwide, as of January 2019, Got the worldwide total, 13,865. Russia, 6,500. Nuclear warheads, the US, 6,185. And then 300 by France, 290 by China. All the other countries, so France, China, UK, Pakistan, India, Israel, North Korea, all um, you know in the hundreds and lower. Okay, so keep those numbers in mind. Now, this is a report that just came out, uh, a future timeline blog, okay, talking about India-Pakistan nuclear war could kill millions and threaten global starvation. Okay, so over the span of less than a week, talking 50 to 125 million people dead, more than the death toll during all six years of World War II. Okay, so this is a University of Colorado Boulder and Rutgers University uh, researchers, you know, a lot of atmospheric physics people, they looked at a hypothetical future conflict and basically today India and Pakistan each have about 150 nuclear warheads. The number is expected to climb by to more than 200 for each country by 2025. And not only would a war kill millions of people locally, but it would likely plunge the entire planet into a severe cold spell possibly with temperatures not seen since the last ice age. Okay, now um, this, these findings come out as tensions are again simmering between India and Pakistan. So in August, India changed its constitution and took rights away from people living in the contested region of Kashmir. Okay, Pakistan criticized that sharply. An India-Pakistan war could double the normal death rate in the world, says two. Now these, again, these are people these are atmospheric and space physics people. This war, this is a war that would have no precedence in human experience. So we've got China, Pakistan, India, we've got the disputed regions of Kashmir uh, here. Okay, now a couple interesting things. Um, uh, when you talk about dystopian situations, catastrophic situations, there's often um, lots of uh, science fiction novels written about it. So we've got Red Mars, and we've got, um, and then there's a book by um, geopolitical analyst, Canadian Gwyn Dyer, Climate War is a Fight for Survival as the World Overheats. So the, the Mars um, trilogy, 
okay, by Kim Stanley Robinson. This is interesting because there's three books, Red Mars, 1992, Green Mars, 93, and Blue Mars, 96. So basically, we have a dystopian Earth. People go to Mars, you know, Mars is initially has to be colonized, turned green, and then water added to it. Now, I haven't read these books, but I think I should. I don't read a lot of fiction, but they look uh, quite interesting. So they talk about, they do talk about uh, a potential war between Pakistan and India and how that would affect the earth. Climate Wars 2011, the fight for survival is the world overheats. This is, uh, you know, waves of climate refugees, dozens of failed states, all out war. Okay, so it's, uh, you know, it looks at these scenarios. Very, very useful uh, book to read. So getting back to um, this uh, article. Um, so the problem is, okay, so if you look at the number of nuclear warheads, this is from 1945 to, to present, basically. It's excluding uh, the U.S. and Russia that I talked about, you know, the number of weapons they have, you know, is, is enormous, right? You know, uh, 6,500 Russia, 6,185 USA, and then we're, now we're just talking about all of these, the rest of these countries here. Okay, so Britain here, you know, peaked about in, in about, you know, 70s, uh, late 60s, 70s. France peaked later. Uh, China was a slow build up here. Um, but look at the build-up from Pakistan and India. The build-up is huge from Pakistan and India. This is, is Israel here. North Korea is too low to be on here. Okay, so how bad can things get if there was a conflict? Okay, so we have lots of data. We have data from the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. We have virus storm data um, from Hamburg bombing, Coventry, etc., other World War II bombs, Tokyo. Um, the team's best estimate is that each bomb could kill about 700,000 people if there was 250 nuclear warheads in total detonated over, over India's and Pakistan's cities. They, the team modeled the amount of aerosols and black carbon and things that would be lofted up into the atmosphere um, from a result of that. And then they used climate models to look at, how the, at the effects of the global climate. And what they found is there would be, if, the, if this is time zero, when the war happens over that week, this is the ocean net, pro, net primary productivity. So if you take all of the production of the plants in the ocean and you subtract the respiration, you get this sort of change. So we'd have a drop of about 50% initially in the ocean productivity. And it would slowly, this is summer, winter, summer, winter, it would eventually come up after about 10 years or so. Okay, this is for 150 teragrams of, um, of, of yield for the exchange. This would be a, a Russia-US uh, nuclear exchange. Pakistan would be more, Pakistan-India would be more along the lines of uh, 40 teragrams. So this, this number here, uh, more like a, uh, so, so, so the, the uh, between the, um, the brownish um, and the red, you know, it would be more like a 20% drop in ocean productivity. Now, if you look at the land net primary productivity, um, a U.S.-Russia exchange, all out war, would block all of the land productivity. There'd be no plant life, no plant, no plant plants growing on the earth initially, right? A hundred percent drop. And then that would take again about 10 years to, to get up, more than 10 years to get up to normal levels, 15 years in this case. Okay, but an India-Pakistan exchange would be more like a 25, 20 to 40 percent drop in land net primary productivity. And here's, here's what net primary productivity looks. Um, and this is, uh, this is the control, so no nuclear war, you know, higher productivity regions. After a nuclear war, two years after, basically you have vast areas on, of the earth that cannot grow any food. So basically, you know, it's, uh, you know, there, there's huge problems for global food supplies, even after a relatively small exchange between India and Pakistan. I'll continue. Thanks for listening.